my paper is divided into three parts uh, in which uh, in, in the first part I would like to discuss about the prehistory of long distance migration that was the indenture one. Uh, and uh, the second part is basically on uh, the indenture level migration uh, which formed this internal migration. And the third part of my presentation is about the peasant awareness, awareness and consciousness of indenture system. So I'll start with my first part. North Indian peasants have been quite mobile, at least from the beginning of the Sultanate rule in India, especially in northern India. It is evident in the poetry and folklore of the region dated back to the 15th century, which are about the separation of a husband from the wife who left who left the house to serve to distant masters. A poem of Abdul Rahim Khan Khana in the Bairwai Chand meters focuses on the such vira, vira is called separation, in the 16th century. The original Bairwai Chand was composed by the wife of a servant of Abdul Rahim Khan Khana to express the love and separation that the newly married wife separated from husband serving to the distant masters. The first ever Barwai went as follow. Away you go, planting the tender sapling of love and desire. Beware, it needs watering, else it might dry up. Another set of song is the Barah Masa, the, 12, the songs of 12 months. As DHA Koff has analyzed the Barah Masa songs, uh, Baramasa are the songs of separation where newly married women left behind in the lonely home expresses their feelings of abandonment and desire. Baramasa poetry consisted of songs of separation of husband and wife or lovers and beloved dated even before the 1600. The seasonal absence of husband in the constant back is the constant backdrop in the patrolist, mercantile and soldiering community and society, such that the rainy season that brings home the husband is the season blessed and looked forward by the women. A woman described her feelings during the first month of the rain that is called Asad in India. All my friends sleep with their husbands, but my own husband is a cloud in another land. In another Baramasa, a woman eagerly waiting for a return of her husband and describe how she feels with the passing of each month. This delicate tissues of love has been expressed as follow. In Kuar, it's an, I mean it's a Hindi month. I get no news, no one comes or goes. Writing, writing on a letter, will I send it? Give it, I pray into my love's hand. So on. So it's it's uh, it, it, it is for the each month. So uh, January, February, and March kind of thing. And you'll find several uh, you know poetry and songs on each month regarding the love and separation of a husband and wife. The pain of separation from the from a husband of a woman has enormously been expressed in the popular songs of northern India. The song sung in the month of Chait that is called Chaitar by the peasants of Gangetic Belt also consists of the painf painfulness of separation of women left behind by their husbands. In some songs, youthful women sharing their desire and pain with sister-in-law. In some, they express their feeling that how the home is not pleasant as the husband is in the another country. G. A. Grierson, who was collector and uh, head of the uh, Linguistic Survey of India, he collected some of the songs, some, some of the songs are as follow. O sister-in-law, my lords come not, comes not. The mango trees are in blossom and the young mangoes are forming. The branches and leaves hangs down as if they, they were in, intoxicated. The fullness of my youth cannot be contained within my bodies. How can I conceal it? <laughs> The Jatsar songs, the song during, I mean, sung during the, uh, during grinding the corn with the hand mill, 
by the women also consists such tissue of love and separation of husband gone distance to do some trade for their master. A song is as follow. O oh my Lord, often goes thou to the east for the trade. How can the days and night be passed? The cart gets stopped in muddy plain and the bullocks in Gujarat. My two eyes stopped in Banaras while my husband was in Jahanabad. So uh, these are the songs uh, sung by Sorry. Uh, as Koff, DHA Koff comments, Indian lyrics often take the women points of view and so the poets, though telling us about the yearning of women left behind in lonely home, does not find it worthwhile enlightening us about their spouses, whereabout or even about the reason for their departure. Thus, the Virihani, the women separated from husband, has become one of the most common heroine of the medieval literature, including early Hindi literature. <coughs> as D.H.A. Koff has shown that, there had been a tradition of peasant to get recruited as the soldiers in Sultanate army. Eastern Hindustan, popularly known as Purab, was an important area for the recruitment of peasant soldiers during the 15th and 16th century under the Sultanate rule of Shah Jahan and the rulers of the Jaunpur. These Purabiya soldiers worked for their emperors at distance places. During the Mughal rule in India, the same Purabiya were in the armies. Mughals recruited peasants as sepoys, especially from the region of Baksar. These soldiers were popular, popularly known as Baksaria. When British East India Company annexed large part of India, it formed a huge army consisting Purabiya sepoys especially from the reason of Baksar. In many songs, the separation of husband and wife is due to the nokari or the service, which is traditional Indian, uh, traditional Indians generally refer to a long distance service, such as service in the British East India Company. The above evidence clearly suggests that village India, especially in UP and Bihar, is unimaginable without a constant outwards stream of sort, medium or long-term migration uh, in the service of military commerce or agriculture. North Indian peasants had served in the army of the Delhi Sultanate and in the other services from the 14th century and had continued to serve in British armies as sepoy despite cultural and religious fears among some of them about crossing the black water. Now I'll take up the issue of uh, this uh, becoming coolies in uh, migration under the indenture system. While the pre-colonial movement of peasants was limited to the internal migration, British rule in India opened up a new possibilities for, mig for migration overseas. These possibilities emerged from the need for labor on plantations created by the evolution of slavery throughout the British Empire. The evolution of slavery by Great Britain in 1833 resulted in a depression in the sugar trade throughout the British Empire. This distress was di directly attributed to the difficulties of obtaining labor. Planters found India a suitable place in which, uh, in which to tap new sources of labor supply, where labor was comparatively cheap and plentiful. And between 1834 and 1920, the recruitment of Indians to work on the colonial plantations of various islands was organized through the indenture system. The model of the indentures, Indian indenture system was borrowed from a policy used by the South of American planters to obtain Chinese labor from the Portuguese settlement of Macau. Under that system, labor was recruited for the planters by their agents to work for a certain time of period, usually five years. During this time, the employer was legally obliged to provide fixed wages, medical attention, at, attentions, and other amenities for the laborers. After the contra contract lapsed, the laborers could either renew his contract or return to his native land. The Indian indenture system had the same terms and conditions with minor verification 
variations between different colonies. Mauritius was the first colony to import indentured labor in 1834, followed by British Guyana in 1838, Trinidad and Jamaica in 1845, the smaller West Indies colonies such as St. Kitts, St. Lucia, St. Vincent, Grenada in 1850s, Natal in 1860s, Suriname in 1873, and Fiji in 1879. During the 80 years of indentured migration, over 1 million, million Indians traveled to those colonies. Till 1880s, more than half millions emig uh, emigrated to the various sugar islands. I have given this data. While indentured emigration was started, many people were already on move in search of work of any nature. Grierson, a colonial ethnographer and head of Linguistic Survey of India, found in early, early 1880s in Bihar that people were going to Nepal for work. When large public, semi-public, or private works commenced, large number of distance workers joined the work. Historian Anand Yang has shown that there had been a tradition of the Saran people Saran district of Bihar, that every year thousands of thousands laborers migrated to Eastern Bengal and Calcutta seasonally. And when agricultural work commenced, they returned to their villages. Large number of Saran people got recruited as indentured in outside of their district. It happened because they left their home to find work, and when they failed to find work within India, they became indentured. Exploring into the trends of indentured emigration to Fiji, Historian Brizlal provides a data which confirms that the majority of intending emigrants had left their home before they were recruited for Fiji. For example, 61.2% single male Ahirs, 75.5% single male Brahmins, and 46.2% single male Chamars of Basti district of United Provinces registered as an indentured uh, themselves out of their district of origin. Not only the single male, but 62.2% Ahids, 86.6% Brahmins, and 45.1% Chamas, single female of Basti district of Uttar Pradesh or UP, registered themselves outside of their origin of the district. It means they were already on move in search of work and ser uh, service. Major Peacher, during his inquiry on the working of the indentured recruitment in Uni United Provinces and Awad in early 1880s, found many check posts that was called nakas locally, where people came for the varied reasons and had got uh, themselves registered for the work in the colonies. To quote Peacher, I quote, Kanpur, Delhi, and Lucknow are great nakas. Allahabad, Faizabad, Benares furnished many recruits from amongst their pilgrims, and Benares from its Sadabrat. Agra is a great Naka, check post, for people for the native states. Mathura afforded many female recruits, being a favorite place for the pilgrim for, with women. Till the mid-19th century, the indentured system was working quite widely in the villages and towns of northern India. A proper rules and regulations were framed and licenses were sanctioned to the recruiters in various districts of United Provinces, Bihar, and Bengal. Grierson's and Peacher's report provide us interesting information on the indenture system in northern India. Legally, there were coolies recruiter, recruitment offices in each district of North India, the head office of which was in Calcutta. Now I'll look into the awareness and consciousness about the system and places of work. Humanitarians and anti-indenture slavery society members and later dominant historiographies contended that the peasants who were being transported to the sugar colonies of the various islands were completely aware, unaware about the places and work conditions. The coolies were being fraudulently recru recruited and most of times kidnapped by the immigration agencies. But the minute details and evidence appeared in the various official reports and non-official writings indicate that there was considerable familiarity about the indentured immigration and the, uh, and the sugar colonies among the peasants in the 19th century as peasants had developed their own vocabularies of the event 
of the overseas emigration under the indenture system. For instance, the word Arkati or Arkati for the recruiter and Mirich for Mauritius were on the lips of the indenture workers who returned from Mauritius after finishing their contract. These words were quite popular in United Provinces and Bihar during 1880s. When Major Fisher and Gershon interviewing peasant to understand their feelings and thoughts on the indenture system. Both found that the destination point had already been conceptually peasantized. A hierarchy of preference seems to have been established at the, at the time. For, exam for example, in UP, Pichar noted that Trinidad, popularly known as Chini Tart, was preferred to Damarera, popularly no known as Damara or Damaraila. Jamaica was considered as good to go. Little was known yet in early 1880s of either Fiji or Natal. It may be due to the late commencement of the immigration in Fiji in, Fiji in 1879 and the fact that Natal received many laborers from South India. Mauritius, popularly known as Mirich, was popular among the North Indian peasants. In UP, Major Peacher reported that the feeling of native community in several places was negative as many people told him, told him such tales as Cooley hangs with his head downwards like a flying fox or in ground in, in for oil. Gerson also heard in Bihar about the above image which was popularly known as Mimiai Katel, the oil extracted from the Cooley's head. I'll show you the picture. Uh, th th this is a, a woodcut <laughs> the picture of the Mimiai Katel. The, 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 the original name is not the Mimiai Katel, but I have given the name because the same <laughs> process was to do the Mimiai Katel thing. However, Gershon found that the hills were, uh, 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 people were very well aware of the fact about colonial immigration that a coolie goes out for five years, that if he stays for 10 years, he will get a free return passage. The climate of the colonies are very delightful, work, and work is highly paid. In some district, he found where returnees were settled, people did not believe in a story about the Mimiai Katel. This, uh, the attention to the stories of Mimiai Katel was also taken by a cartoonist of the period. Hence, a Chinese schoolmaster in Georgetown provided the following woodcut, which is there, to Edward Jenkins, who was a, who was who was on a visit to British Guyana to write a book on the conditions of coolie laborers. So this is the... The rumor of Mimiai Katel might be arising due to the demand of young and the able bodies workers for the plantation works. Planters had instruction to the immigration agencies and recruiters in the countryside regarding the layout of an immigrant labor. Hence, the objection to the old age male or female and high demand of young and able body immigrants provided a basis for a rumor such as Mimiai Katel. Emigration as loss also figured in the rural talk in other way as well. For instance, Gershon heard in the countryside that if anyone's sons or brother disappeared after a family quarrel and was not heard again, it was at once concluded that he was gone to Tapu Island and nothing more is thought about it. In this way, observed Grierson that the colonies get the credit of being a kind of lim limbo, where everyone goes who is lost sight of, and hence they got a bad name as a place where once a person goes, 10 chances to, to one, he were never heard of again. Some people told Grierson that it is very difficult to leave the Janam Bhumi, or the motherland, but describe the positive aspect of the immigration in the context of caste rules. Thus, they acknowledged to Gershon that a man can eat everything on the board the ship, a vessel being like a temple of Jagannath, without caste restrictions. Some returned emigrants said to Gershon that they used to send letters but never received any replies as their families and friends in India did not know about their address. And the friends of coolies who had not returned said that they had never heard from them. Although limited, but the letters and remittances were being definitely sent by the indentures from the colonies. 
Gyorshan noticed a large correspondence between emigrants and their relatives in India. I have given the data of these uh, letters. These are the uh, data on the letters and then uh, this is the data on remittances. Although letters were written by the emigrants, but many a time letters did not reach to India due to the wrong address or, or uh, wrong alphabets in the address. For instance, I found such an undelivered letter of a Surajuddin, a Girmitiya in Bath district of Fiji from Kampbelpur of Punjab, India, whose letter found dead due to mistake in the spelling in the writing, uh, writing his address. Here is the last letter of Surajuddin. I found this letter in uh, Fiji archive, uh, which was in the dead letter box. The letter was written in, uh, uh, I think, 1907 or something. But uh, it was not delivered because of the, um, the wrong address or the wrong alphabet in the address. So it returned back to Fiji. And uh, so I, I got this letter uh, in Fijian archives. Laborers also filed a petition to appoint a Hindustani knowing write, uh, writing in the, uh, in the post office so that he can at least write correct address on the postcard. Ramchand Rao, he was a fe famous pe uh, peasant leader in Uttar Pradesh in 1930s. He was also an indentured laborer from Fiji. 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 And famous peasant uh, Fiji, he wrote the following petition, I'll show this, this is the petition written by um, Baba Ramchand. On behalf of the Girmitias of the Bar District, regarding the appointment of a Hindustani knowing clerk in the post office before returning to India. So he wrote a long letter to the secret, colonial secretary and uh, asking to appoint a, a Hindustani knowing person who can at least write a, a, you know, correct address and name so that letter will go and to the their uh, destinations. Oh. I also, f uh, okay. In the early 20th century, novelist Manand Dvedi Gajpuri, in his piece, Ram Lal focuses on the importance of letter and postal system for those whose skin has migrated. So uh, once this uh, emigration was going on, uh, it also attracted the attentions of the various novelists of the period. So late 1880s or 90s, in many novel of northern India, you will find people are mentioning about the someone's letter and remittances came and how uh, this post office uh, guy cheated and taken some money, bribe, to deliver their letter or maybe to deliver their remittances. So in one uh, instance, uh, Manand Dvedi Gajpuri, he was a famous novelist, he wrote, today is Wednesday. Parents and wives of emigrants are looking out, of the, out for the postman. A red turban band around the ankles and leather bag is hanging on the soldier's shoulder. This is not a simple bag. This is a treasure of the hope and sorrow of the people. This very bag brings the money earned by the sweated labor of the poor in countries as far flung as Rangoon, Canada, Natal, and Mauritius. The truth of the Gaspuri novel regarding the remittances sent by the indentured laborers from overseas plantation can be assumed through many other letters sent by indentured laborers through the government postal channel. In 1880s, an indentured laborer, Siu Prasad, from Sultanpur, UP, to Durban, Natal, sent 50 pounds, was acknowledged by the protector of the emigrants at Calcutta. Our letter was sent by the laborer asking the confirmation of remittances to his family in India, which was not yet reached even after two years, reproduced below. So this is another letter uh, written by someone from Natal. He was serving in Natal and asking that uh, my money has reached or not. So he wrote to uh, 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 agent in, uh, colony, um, emigration agent in Calcutta and uh, uh, asked about his uh, remittances and money. One second, please. Okay, now a returnees, 
uh, so uh, we found that there are lots of uh, uh, postal communications as well. Indenture emigration became well known phenomena in the northern India due to the returnees, where who were informing about the system, working conditions in the colonies, etc., to their fellow villagers. Grierson and Peacher interviewed many returnees and found that these returnees assisted fellow villagers to emigrate on the plantations. He quote quotes the case of a Rajput family of the Shahabad district of Bihar in which entire family migrated because of two, Ra two Rajput's returnees from Mauritius named Ajodhya Singh and Savarika Singh, who themselves emigrated with the family. Marina Carter and Crispin Bates in their writing have talked about the about the such networks playing a significant role in the migration. Marina Carter has emphasized the role of returnees as a vital link between migrants and their kin, uh, kin or kith or the village uh, folks in the colonies. Carter demonstrate with reference to Ramashami, whose father Mac Makhan had gone to Mauritius in 1843. Returnees visited Ramaswamy on several occasions bringing money and messages uh, for his father. As a result of the activities of the returnees, such as those who had contract, con contacted uh, Ramaswamy, new emigrants were provided with a clear objective in imagination and the chain style, uh, yeah, chain style, migration effectively operated informally within the formal structure of the indenture uh, uh, recruitment. Grierson met some returnees who had served money during their uh, terms as indenture laborers, saved money during their terms of the indenture labor. He gave example of the men like Navi Box who came back after nine years in Jamaica with RS 1,800 rupees. One Govardhan Patak came after 10 years from Demerera with 1,500 rupees and spent 3,000 to 400 in getting back to the caste because it was a kind of uh, uh, taboo. Ki once you will cross the water, you lose the caste. So again, you need to, to get back in the caste, you need to perform some of the Brahminical uh, things and then you will get back. So <coughs> they, 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 they spent three to four hundred rupees even to get back into the caste when they returned back. So, right. Marina Carter has provided a fine analysis of the process by which a return a migrant such as Ghura Khan became a recruiter. For Carter, it was a strategy to mobilize the labor force in India for the sugar colonies as returnees was a returnees proved to be the best inform informant about the work conditions and life in the colonies. As Marina has argued that deputing returnees as a recruiter was the only uh, strategy and cost-effective measure, but it was also a correction to the argument given by the critics of the indenture system. As she puts, by integrating new arrivals into Indian social and economic networks in Mauritius, which were increasingly independent of plantation returnees, fulfilled the function of attracting emigrants to the colony in spite of poor prospect for such workers. Crispin Bates and Marina Carter in their provoking article have provided evidence of subaltern networks through which indenture workers were emigrating from India to the colonies. According to them, the historians of indenture have depicted it through discourse of slavery and freedom and hence failed to understand the subaltern migration strategies. For them, returnees, sardars and recruiters created out of the indenture dynamic that operated clearly outside the uh, planter administrator, administrator worldwide that created his own uh, world. Now I'll move to the conclusion. Sorry. So my paper challenges the conception that conception of Indian peasant and workers as static by providing evidence of historic migrant migratory patterns in northern India from at least time of the establishment of the Sultanate rule. Indenture migration became part of such migration. Uh, such migration during colonial India and hence peasants and workers who were hitherto inland migrants found a route to go beyond the sea to work in the long distance plantations of Caribbean, Pacific and Indian oceans. To distinguish indenture from inland migration, North Indian peasants developed their own vocabularies of the system. These new vocabularies are evidence of those of their awareness of the indenture system. 
Once, emig once emigrants serve in the colonies, they develop a network with their fellow kinsmen back home, encouraging them to take the long journey of indenture with prospect of a life better than the one in their native village. They also sent remittances to their families back home. The various letters and money dispatches confirms the communication links between the emigrants and their family at home. However, colonial emigration was in many ways different from the pre-existing pattern of internal labor migration, which offered migrants a stronger chance to get back to their homes. Overseas, overseas migration on contrast on contract of indenture entailed longer absence and lower chances to return to their home. Thank you.